easygoing, good-humored, affable, honest, and gritty. Any one of these adages could easily describe Rhett Walker, the Southern Soul frontman for the Grammy-nominated Rhett Walker Band. Throwing out terms like grace, mercy, peace, and love as if they are everyday actions rather than a Sunday-only study, Rhett's no-frills gospel-centered approach to songs and storytelling has endeared him to audiences of all different shapes, sizes, and yes, sometimes even beliefs. On the heels of releasing the brand new Rhett Walker Band EP, the family man father of four shares his real life heart behind his relevant roots rock on this most honest features on film. I'm your host, Andrew Greer. All right, so first thing I want to ask is about being a preacher's kid, because even from the time you walked into this room and from all I've heard about you, you've got this mischievous kind of style and you know streak in you but you're preacher's kid so growing up in that environment with that role with some of the expectations or assumptions was that like oil and water oh for sure for <laughs> sure i think like i didn't hit mischievous rhett and i probably haven't lost it yet um i was like 15 16 years old and so homeschooled grew up in the church like it was everything you would expect it mm -hmm. to be um, but I had real good parents, and my mom and dad were always, you know, keep God first, work hard, and chase after your dreams. But then my dad got a church when I was 16 in South Carolina. We moved, started a, uh, the high school, knew no one, so that was kind of, it was very formative years for me, mm -hmm. but then also, like, trying to figure out how to fit in and trying to, like, make friends and not be the weirdo that stands in the corner, like... And so then my, my dad being a pastor, I knew how to get out of everything. <laughs> like I knew how to, I knew how to say I was sorry. And knew, I mean, look for, for this is horrible. And I've never said this story before, but I'll go out on a limb here. And Keeps it coming. <laughs> we go to um, like a Halloween, Christian Halloween house. Where like oh, yeah, scary yeah. Judgment house. Judgment house. Yeah. And so the person that was playing Jesus um, had this like kind of rapper tone to his voice or like radio tone. And so it just sounded funny the way you do it. And so I, I, uh, I wrote down a funny name because they wanted you to write down your name. And I saw that the Jesus guy was calling out everybody's name in the, in the room. <laughs> so I wrote down a funny name just because I was immature and dumb. And when, they, when he hit that name, everybody in that room laughed. Just I mean, lost it. Lost it so much and we couldn't get it back that they turned the lights on. <laughs> At Judgment House? At Judgment House. <laughs> went out of character, brought us all to a back room, and they were like, who wrote this this name down? And I was like, oh, man, I've got to own up. So I raised my hand. And they were like, you're the reason we had to stop this thing. And I was like, I'm going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> like, it's over for me. And so I was like, I've been, I've been, living, been living wrong. And I was like, I just, oh, no. I just want to get my life right. <laughs> and so they were like, oh, that's awesome. And so I got <laughs> off the hook because I was like, I just want to be living. you got like, rededicated? Yes, basically, yeah. <laughs> so now having a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old boy, I'm like, don't you dare try to play that game with me. Like my son <laughs> always goes over his PlayStation time. He's like, you know what, Dad, I'm sorry for disrespecting you. Like, that's something I'm continuing to work on. I'm like, nah, nah, you're, 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 you're still grounded. You're still grounded. I done did that. You're still grounded. So, so they have that a little bit of that streak. In oh them. yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. we're we're from the south, and yeah. it's we live. We try to live happy, happy mm -hmm. lives, and so sometimes we we play too much, you know. But growing up, that was kind of how it went, and I was walking that that fine line of showing out and getting attention. But also, I was raised in a way like I knew better, mm -hmm. you know? So when I was 17, um, I'd met this girl, and we dated for two months till the day we got married. So we dated for two weeks, and then the rest of the two months was planning on getting married. Because we got pregnant. Um, it was during the summer before my Christian, uh, before my senior year of high school at a Christian school. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had just graduated and was super smart and... So uh, I was like, man, I can't, like, I can't get out of, out of trouble. Like, everybody knows I now have to, like, walk my life, like, as an adult. Like, I can't keep doing this. It was also when I was, like, really figuring out, like, who Jesus was because um, I'd heard it my whole life. 
and I believed it. But it was kind of that moment I was like, man, I can't keep getting out of trouble because of who my dad is. Mm. But I also can't go to heaven on my daddy's coattails. Like if I really believe Jesus is who Jesus is, like Rhett's got to figure that out. Mm. You know, I've got to look for that scripture and find out who he is. So. so you believed, like when you say what I believed it, you believed in the tenets of the faith. Yeah. But they weren't necessarily translating into like in a personal way. Or like, what was the transition? What shifted? I, I knew for the you? stories. Okay. Um, I knew who Jesus was. I knew the stories of Jesus. I just never paid much attention to it mm-hmm. um, because I was always around it. That mm-hmm. was life. Like uh-huh. I, I grew up literally in the church building. Um, but when that happened, I really saw grace for the first time. Like, this ain't the end of the world. Mm-hmm. Like, I can have a future like raising this kid and I don't want them to run around not understanding grace till they're 17, Mm -hmm. like in me finding it out for the first time. So it, I mean, it was that pivotal moment. It was like, this, this is a change. Like this is big. Like we're going to live like this for now on. So we got married and two months later and been married for 14 years now. I mean, that's very interesting to me because a lot of people, something like uh, an unexpected pregnancy in your teenage years would like I think we all have these points in life where we have decisions to either press in to God or pull away from God yeah. and I think a lot of people that even specific circumstance in the south a preacher's kid at a Christian school I mean yeah. I feel like you were set up to then pull away from God to have to because yeah. the the regiment says that's not acceptable well, everything I had known was kind of why I was who I was. Uh-huh. So inst- but instead of running, for some reason, I was just like, no, there's more to the story. And I saw it through my dad's church too, which is funny because my dad was like, you're going to stand up in front of the church and tell everybody what's going on. And when I did, I was scared half to death. When I did, that church was like rallying around like, it's going to be hard. You're not going to have enough money. You're going to freak out at nights when this baby don't go to sleep. <laughs> but we're going to be a part of this and mm. we're going to help. And they threw my wedding. Like there was probably 800 people at my wedding and I didn't even know 800 people. Like that church was like, no, we don't. W-. And it was almost like, we don't want you to run. Like, we want you to know the reason we're here. I mean, but the Christian school I was at kicked me out. There, and I was like, <laughs> now's when I need you the most. Like yeah. I've got my senior year next. Yeah. And so it was this weird, like back and forth. But I honestly think it was seeing that grace and, and seeing freedom mm-hmm. where all the scary stuff doesn't, didn't seem as scary. I, I didn't care about anything else. It was just like, man, this is God's got us. Like we just got to keep focused. There's a lyric in the new EP and it's from the song like your father does, but wherever you go, whatever you do, I want you to know there's nothing to prove. I've always, always loved you. And I always, always will. And then at the end of that course, it turns it to God. He's always loved you. He always will. Was that your first experience with this notion of grace, like a God who loves you with absolutely zero expectations. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd never been able to craft that into words until this song. Um, Because man, society tells us you'll never be good enough. Like you're not gonna be good enough at this. You're not gonna be good enough. You're not gonna look good enough. You're not gonna have enough stuff. So it's easy to equate that when you have a loose walk with Jesus because you then bring in that narrative. And I think when, when me and April found out we were pregnant and then to see the, over these past 14 years, like what God has done, it doesn't tell Rhett and April's story. Mm-hmm. Like it has nothing to do with Rhett and April. This could be anybody's story. Mm-hmm. It shows how big of a God we, we serve and that loves us. So it is that man, like we have, we have nothing to prove. We have nothing to prove as in like we can be good enough, but we also have nothing to give. Like, mm-hmm. Even where I was talking about this the other day with a friend, even like the song Greater You Lord, we do it in our church a lot. And I was listening to that song and it's like, um, it's your breath in my lungs, so we pour out our praise. Like we can't even do the thing we were created to do, which is to lift up the name of Jesus without him giving us the breath in our lungs. Like we have nothing to offer, but he said we are worth it. So it was it was that moment I was like, not nah, like God, God ain't counting me out here. Like I can't count myself out here. Like there's things that we can accomplish if we just keep focused. 
doesn't that also shift how you interact and see other people? Like if, if this is true, if Grace says that for the cross, our relationship with Jesus, with God, is an even playing field, it's level. If that's true, then I would think that changes the way I'm able to interact and be with other people because there's nothing they can do. There's nothing I can do. It's all level, right? It's yeah. what God is doing through us. Does that change? Like, has y'all's story and living that out and continuing to live that out uh, changed your perspectives about other people, you think? Oh, for sure. For sure. <clears throat> One of the things me and my wife talk about all the time is, especially in ministry, like, she is a creative director at a church, and, like, I lead worship when I'm not on the road, which is few and far between, but I love to do it. Um, but I think one of the biggest problems, and I was talking about this with another one of our pastors, um, who's a, a young African American guy, with racism, with how we see these people, with how we see this sin, it, it's sympathy. Like we don't sympathize. We're not naturally inclined to sympathize with other people. We see people through our lens that says, "This is how I've lived my life. This is how. This is what's right." And we don't sympathize with others and go, what about their background? Like, what about what made them? What psychological stuff has, has made them see through this lens? So me and my wife, we try to start there. Mm -hmm. Like, a human's a human. What led him to here? What led her to here? And we know that the one foundation we have being Jesus is unchanging. Mm -hmm. So that's the same for everybody across the board. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's drastically changed. I mean, am I still human? And I'm like, oh, God, I just don't want to deal with this per why, uh -huh. why is this person taking four hours in Dollar General line? Like, go <laughs> on. Like, yeah, but I mean, it, it does help me see people. I try to make sure I'm seeing through that lens uh -huh. of like, I don't know their story. I yeah. don't know what they're carrying. But I know what I did, and I'm so thankful a church rallied around me and was like, we might not have been in this, but like we understand it. We're going to walk it with you. There's that. Old, I think it's attributed to Ian McLaren, quote that be kind, everyone you cross paths with or whatever is fighting a hard battle. Yeah. You know, everyone's got a hard struggle. It's uh, also interesting, like the way you coined it in, on the EP, the song Murderer, which is a provocative title and uh, even more provocative to kind of be like accusing your whole audience of being murderers. <laughs> yes, yes. But that's uh, <laughs> another way to look at it, though, from a maybe more scriptural angle or theological or whatever, is like this fact that it's also, as humans, as neighbors, we're all even because we've all, I mean, the reason Jesus died. I mean, that's the, yeah. the premise of the song is every single one of us and whatever we've done to distance ourselves from God. That's the reason. We don't have a percentage of the cross. Like Jesus went and died on the cross because I made him have to do it for 10%. But you'd, you lived a worse life, so you, he had to do it because of 25%. Like, nah, man, we... He died, be, so we talked about this earlier, so that we could be reconciled with God. Like, mm -hmm. the, he had to take the judgment so that way there could be the redemption. Uh -huh. And none of us get to say, I'm glad there wasn't much judgment he had to take on my part because I've lived a pretty good, easy life. Uh -huh. Like, nah, man, it's, it, we're all sinners and we're, we all put him on the cross. Mm -hmm. So therefore, like, we are the murderers that, that yelled crucify. Mm -hmm. Like, you can pretend all you want to. You wouldn't have been that, you know, maybe saying crucify out there when that was happening. But, like, you're the reason he's, he's having to lay down his life. And so, yeah, it's provocative, but I like to drop grenades every now and then anyways. And I think it's a good every reminder. Yeah, <laughs> once a day. I yeah, yeah, okay. But, like, whenever you're driving and you hear that song, my hope is it's like you can have a very peaceful moment in your car going, now I do cry mercy because it goes, I cry crucified. Now I cry mercy and there is mercy. Like it's not something we have to like gain. Like mm -hmm. it is there. We're so even it. though we are like that bad and evil and the murder, like there is mercy for every single one of us. And to me, dark, provocative, whatever, like that is such a redemption, like redemptive thing, man. And I just, I wrote it. And I hope people will dig it. But, like, I need to remind myself of that. Like, I have to remind myself of that often. I got four kids. So I have to remind myself of that often that God giving me mercy, like, give them mercy and uh -huh. grace right now, even uh -huh. though they're tearing your house apart. <laughs> you keep having them, though. I know. I do. I do. Because <laughs> you're on the fourth. 
Number four. Yeah. 13, 11, five, and three and a half months. And who knows next, right? Who knows? We always said we wanted to adopt. <laughs> okay. But we keep having babies. <laughs> so we're going to have to get cable or something. We're going to have to find something else to do at night. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know if you can put that in there. Sure. I hope so. Yeah. Because <laughs> look, every married person watching realized... this, they know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Do you share your story from the beginning of your relationship? You're in your wife's uh, beginning of y'all's family. Do you share that story now with now you've got a 13 year old? Yeah. You share that story with them and how do you do that? In an age appropriate way or is it like, yeah, we kind of decided early on at 12, we want to really talk about the yeah, details. Yeah, so when she's 13 now, I think we told her when she was 11. Okay. Um, she, everybody, like they talk about things at school like mm -hmm. we homeschool our kids, but all of their friends, they just talk about things that we did not. I know I didn't talk about when I was that age. Sure. Like I was, 10, I think 11. I was still playing with cars in the dirt at 11. <laughs> Maybe I was a nerd, but like, <laughs> and so just, just things are talked about so much more. So we, we had conversations about all of the birds and the bees and all that stuff early. And then, well, she already knows that part. We said, Hey, look, you know, we, we were this age and we were able to set the platform of like, there's nothing you could do that'll make us not love you. There's nothing you could do that we would disown you. But here's how this made our life more difficult at the time. You were the one good thing out of it, but we had to figure out life. We were babies having babies. Yeah, like, yeah. And so she feels like she's the one that started this family. Like she's like, I created this thing. Like we, <laughs> we y'all became yeah, married, like yeah. all that. <clears throat> so she loves that part. But I also think she she began to see, like what I was saying earlier, I wanted her to realize who Jesus is and the grace that he has before she does something that's a life-changing event and goes, ooh, I need Jesus. Like, I don't want to preach her Jesus her whole life. I want her to see, like, now, nah, babe, there's grace and there's mercy for you. Like, and he loves you. Like, you know how much your daddy loves you? I would do anything for you. Like, it, it can't even compare to the love mm -hmm. of Jesus, you know? I knew God had blessed my life From the sound of your first cry You made us a family And I ain't ever gonna leave I felt it then, I feel it now Through every single up and down So when the world says you're nothing Oh, let me tell you something Ain't nobody gonna, ain't nobody gonna love you, love you like your father does. Ain't nobody gonna, ain't nobody gonna love you, love you like your father does. Yeah, time won't slow down And I won't always be around To listen to your worries I hold you when you're hurting So let me point you to the one Who's with you till it's done Take his hand, he won't let go He gave his life to bring you home Ain't nobody Gonna, ain't nobody gonna love you, love you like your father does. Ain't nobody gonna, ain't nobody gonna love you, love you like your father does. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I want you to know there's nothing to prove. I've always, always loved you And I always, always will Wherever you go, whatever you do I want you to know there's nothing to prove He's always, always loved you Oh, and He always, always will Ain't nobody gonna Ain't nobody gonna love you like your father does Ain't nobody gonna Ain't nobody gonna love you Like your father does Ain't nobody gonna Ain't nobody 
gonna love you, love you like your father does. Everybody's got a story. Sure. Like, and I want to know those stories. Yeah. Like, I want to know what people are going through. I want to know if I can help. Because another thing I was talking about with a friend the other day, like, what are we, who, what are we doing? Like, if we're a Christian, like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm just singing songs, mm-hmm. like, cool. But if I'm watching, like, issues and crime and problems and poverty and people not eating, and those are just the first people in the front row at my church, mm-hmm. and I sing them a cool worship song, like, what am I doing unless I'm, like, listening to their story and getting in the dirt with them? And sure. so that's, that's what I want to be. I don't want to be remembered for songs. I want to be remembered as a person that's like, Dude, Rhett told his story, and then he'd help us, and he'd hang out with us, and he walked through life with us. It's it's like what you're um, <clears throat> exampling in your relationship with your kids. Like you're having the hard conversations before they are hard conversations for them, or before they're hard scenarios yeah. and circumstances. Which I think gives them a leg up. One to know they can talk about it, that kind of thing. But it's like we were talking about earlier too. We we're talking about in this uh, current culture where suicide and suicide prevention has become a big. Uh, conversation. We we're talking about how the VMAs, yeah. right? What they had this all these people yeah. who were on the path of contemplating and just didn't go through suicide, with it. right? Didn't go through with it. Come up and say, "Hey, there is hope. <laughs> there is a path. There is a way." And and I think it's okay. And since you have to drop one provocative grenade a day or whatever, we can do this. But it is interesting why, as in an artistic or a genre that is defined by the name or the script of a faith of Jesus, Christianity, that we are not more proactive in being the headlights yeah. for these things. Like we were saying, maybe that should be the Doves. Maybe that should be the Kayla Fan Awards. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there's people, like I, I love and respect Matt Maher mm-hmm. because he's, he's very outspoken about being salt and light. You know, and, and just loving on people. Um, but I think we do a, a horrible job for the most part because I, I do think like there's it's a career. Mm-hmm. And so you're worried because if you say this, you might eliminate this fan sure. base. If you say this, like, but the, the reality is like it's, it's a lose-lose, but it's also a win-win. Mm-hmm. So I've always just been, I want to have the hard conversations. I want to talk to people. I want to hear their story, and then I want to be the salt and light of that. And man, when I saw that on the VMAs with Logic playing that song, I was like, "Why? Why is that not us? Like, it really is. Like, we're the. They're singing a story, going, "There's hope. Like, you don't have to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. We know where the real hope comes from. <laughs> because guess what? If you just go, "Hey, don't commit suicide. There's hope. In what? Mm-hmm. Like, there's no hope for my kids. Mm-hmm. There's no hope." Um, I was talking with my buddy Propaganda just about um, racism just being so alive and well. And like, there's no hope that we hope that racism ends, but there's no, our hope isn't in racism ending because this world is trash. And so like, until until we meet Jesus face to face, that's where our hope lies. Mm-hmm. So why are we not on the forefront going, hey, yeah, I, I'll stand by this. There is hope, mm-hmm. but that hope is in Jesus. Mm-hmm. It seems like that's the way of Jesus. It's like, even if you look at stories from the Bible and people who are falling and seeking his company and his presence, I don't know that they were going, I'm seeking your religion, or I want to know what you think about A, B, and C, but I like you. Yeah. You know, I don't want to dumb it down, yeah. being Jesus being God in human form, but I think they liked him. I think yeah. they were drawn to him and to his company, and that must have had something to do with authenticity. Yeah. So, you know... I don't think I don't people want to roll you up. To Jesus no, here, don't right? compare me. <laughs> okay, do okay, not okay, compare me to Jesus. <laughs> no, I would just say like, I I do think that there's before the miracles, before any of that, when he was walking on earth and people were starting to follow and the stories that they had heard before that said there is this coming, like they didn't just go, ooh, the paintings look like him, so that's mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Like stories started to match up, mm-hmm. like through lineage and how he acted and who he was, and it was like. Dude, I want to know. I want, like, what? This, there's something with this guy, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think that's how it has to be as a believer, mm-hmm. as a Christian, to just be like, man. I if every conversation starts with there's something about this person, mm-hmm. and I not to 
put it into a box or make it small, but just to be able to think about it easier. I think about it in my church. Like in my church, a lot of those people that come in, they're either been in church their whole life, um, they came because their parents brought them there, or that's the last resort. Hmm. And so a lot of, we got to remember, a lot of people don't know the truth that we know. So they're coming in there, and I call them shadow people. They hide in the shadows where the lights don't hit, and they're just like, God, you got to tell me something because this is my last resort. Mm-hmm. you know. And, man, if, if they walk in and they see me and, or see another worship leader or another staff, meet, staff member, and they're like, dude, there, there's something different about this dude than who I usually hang out with. Like, mm-hmm. that's, the first, that's the first start. We all know. Like, that's how it begins. Mm-hmm. It all starts over coffee. Yeah. Like, you don't have to go through the theological seminary <laughs> immediately. <laughs> you know, the last question I keep thinking of is, what is the name that you wrote down in Judgment House? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, so there was an old rapper. Okay. When I was in high school, his name was Mike Jones. <laughs> and Mike Jones was kind of like DJ Khaled, like always yelling. Uh-huh. And he'd go, Mike Jones. And so Jesus was saying names like that, or the God playing Jesus. And dude, <laughs> when he, it was, uh, you know, Whatever, a certain person, uh, April this, Mike Jones, <laughs> dude. And then finally we'd like get caught up and then somebody go, <laughs> and the whole place is just, yeah, I ruined that That's judgment acceptable. house. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the judgment house might have ruined itself. Yeah, I think there was a lot of judgment on me in that house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah.